Are we? Yeah. Hi, guys. Welcome to London Developer Circles and to tonight's event and the beautiful Rathbone Square Facebook building. Uh, my name is Amy. I'm a solution architect at Curvestone, an AI services company, and I'm also one of the co leads here at the London branch of this community, along with Seb, who's lurking at the back and putting us, waving at us now, and also Brianna, who is very sad that she can't be here today, but I think we can spare a moment of sympathy. She's at home recovering from wisdom tooth surgery, so... <laughs> A little bit more about us, if you haven't been here at all, then this is your first time here. Developer Circle is a community run by developers for developers, and we try to provide a space to connect and bond over tech, share ideas, learn from one another, and also, above all, to build new things together. On that note, we're about to announce London DevC's first hackathon. It'll be taking place within the next couple of months. So if you're interested, please can you keep an eye on our London Facebook group. We'll be posting all of the details there. And if for any reason you can't make it, don't panic. We'll be providing plenty of opportunities for more events like that throughout the course of 2020. Tonight's event. Uh, I am... Really delighted to welcome Amit Sangani here this evening. We've had quite a lot of feedback from the community over the last few months saying that they'd like to learn more about the career progression opportunities available to developers. So Amit is going to talk to us this evening about his career through Silicon Valley, from working in startups to big companies, to co-founding his own startup, and later becoming an angel investor as well. So it's probably best if I let the man himself talk about his own journey. So if you could please all join me in giving Amit a warm welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, Amy. How's everyone doing? Good. Good? Thank you so much for taking out the time to come over. I know you have been working whole day and we have beer and refreshments uh, to keep you away. By the way, just a little bit about me. I was in Berlin a couple of days back. I came here on Monday and then heavily jet lagged. And then I just came to know yesterday that I'm going to speak for entire one hour. So I may go doze off to sleep, but hopefully you guys keep on applauding and so I'll keep myself away. So, I'm going to talk about leadership in technology and uh, software engineer to CTO. Now, you might wonder, what is CTO here? Because I'm director, so I was a start uh, startup founder and a CTO, so I'm going to go and talk about that. But before I do that, um, let's make this super interactive. Feel free to ask me questions. Just raise your hands. Um, it's going to be a one-hour talk. I don't probably have enough material for one hour, so I want you guys to ask me questions. Um, but before I go into that, um, I have a couple of questions for you guys. Uh, how many of you are individual contributors, so work as software engineers? OK. And how many of you are managers? OK, so the ratio is about 20 to 80 or 25 to 75. So it will be fun. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk my, my discussion and topics of um, content will be related to both of you guys, so it should be fun. for. And, and a good learning experience. A uh, couple of more questions. How many of you are immigrants? Here, okay. That's about 50%. And how many of you have English as your second language? Oh, wow. Okay, so all of you guys for last two questions are exactly like me. So I'm an immigrant. I grew up in Bombay. And, um, and I'm going to go over these three things. But I grew up in Bombay. I moved to California, and English was my second language. I didn't learn English until about like fifth grade. So, so uh, it was always hard for me to pick up my curriculum after that. So I'm going to talk about these three things. Uh, my journey, obviously, and hopefully this is interesting. I've lived in Silicon Valley for about 20 years, and I've gone through multiple cycles of ups and downs and I would love to share all of that with you. I'm also going to talk about engineering culture and getting it right. So I obviously founded my own startup and grew the team and the company. We had 20 million 
monthly active users. We have 70,000 paid customers. The product is still going on. And uh, I'll talk about that. And I'll also talk about Facebook's engineering culture, because both are very similar. Um, and I think some of the learnings you as managers or aspiring leaders who are individual contributors, you guys can benefit out of that. And then I'm going to talk about partner engineering and the value delivered by this function within our company. This is a pretty unique role. But as I talk about it, I think you guys will relate to why partner engineering is important within and as a function within your company. Okay. And again, let's make this interactive. If you have questions, stop me, and we can, we can, you can ask me, and I can answer that question. So, <coughs> so I, I grew up in Bombay, and um, if you get, how many of you guys have visited India? Okay, a lot of you guys. And Bombay, Mumbai. Okay, a few of you guys. Okay. So Mom Bombay is a fascinating city. I grew up there, and you have huge disparity. You have a lot of poor people who make less than $50 a day, or $50 a month. And you have the most expensive house, which is $2 billion worth of, um, and, and it's, um, and the person who lives there is the one of the richest people in, in India. As a, as a student, I was a very mediocre student. And the reason why I'm saying this is because when I saw you guys uh, raise your hands for those two questions, I think all of you guys are in the same boat as I am, or I am in the same boat as what you guys were. Um, I hated school because our school curriculum was everything was based on memorization. And I just couldn't fit in all the content in my brain. Um, it was hard, and I always used to try to find areas where I can use logic. And so math was clearly one area where I could excel. But all the other uh, subjects, I was always pretty poor at it. And because if you're in a middle class family, the only way for you to become a uh, raise your standard of living is to have a good job. And to have a good job, you need to be a professional. And professions are, there's like two or three major professions. That's what people consider, like engineer, doctor, lawyer, that's it. <laughs> um, so I, I obviously was not very good at studies, so I thought I'm doomed in my life. I won't be able to do anything because everything required memorization. I'm really bad at it, and I couldn't succeed in life. Fortunately, computer science was one of the curriculum. They had just introduced that. And I got introduced to computer science, specifically Unix and C programming, when I was in, I think, high school. And it was one of the best things which has happened in my life. Because the tutor explained exactly how to write programs, what is computers, how the machines work, what are the bits and bytes, and all of that. And everything I could just get it. And that, to me, was like the breakthrough. Because it, without that, I would have never been able to figure out, that, hey, this is the area where I want to study. So if, after finishing high school, I decided to do computer engineering. And fortunately, there was nobody applying for computer engineering. Nobody wanted to be in computer science. So initially, I was thinking about going and doing electronic engineering or electrical engineering. And there were, the seats were full, so I moved to computers. Again, stroke of luck, right? But that's what I thought I wanted to do. But as soon as I go into computer engineering, I found like I had to do all sorts of other subjects uh, along with that. Um, but anyways, I ended up finishing my computer science and studied the, and worked there for a couple of months before I moved to uh, Canada. Oh, sorry. I need to go back. clicked once too many. How many of you have heard about Corel Draw? A lot of you guys. That's good. So Corel was one of very unique companies. Um, they built the back-end engine, or actually they built a full finished product, but one of their powers was their computer graphics engine. And before Photoshop, they had two products, Corel Draw and Corel Photo Paint. 
And I was doing some mediocre job as soon as I finished my computer engineering. And I moved to Canada. And um, so Corel came to India to hire people. They had this um, massive recruiting event. And there were like 80 people who attended. And like 15 or 20 of them they selected. And I was one of them. And I moved to Canada. But that was amazing difference, right? I was doing some mediocre software, moved to Corel, and now I'm working on this graphics engine, which is affecting millions of people out there. Um, to me, that showed the power of computer science and being able to affect people's lives in a tremendously impactful way. There's no other soft field, not for, forget about software, but any field where you change a couple of hours of code and it can affect, and then you push it out, and it can affect millions of people. So everything was great. I was at the peak of my life um, career. I enjoyed the co compensation and the crazy benefits. Um, but the only thing I didn't like was the cold. I went from plus 30 degrees centigrade to minus 30 degrees centigrade. And, um, there are a couple of other weirdness things, because I grew up in India. I had never been out of India. And when I moved to Canada, you know, you don't only have to learn the language and the accent and all of that, but you have to learn the other nuances of like gestures and some other things. And how many of you guys have heard about Indian nodding? Indian, yeah? It's pretty funny. Because when I went there, I had this habit of whenever a question is asked, I would always do this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, nobody could understand, are you saying yes or no? Because yes is this and no is this. Um, and th that was the first, in the first week I learned very quickly that I need to do this and this to answer questions. Um, there's another thing which was pretty weird and I think I, I would love to share. It. So what's up? was a term which I had never heard in India. And when I come, f like my second day at work, my manager said, hey, what's up? I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> I have no idea what to, how to respond to that. And uh, then I asked my friend, like, what does it mean? So he said, oh, no, just say, yeah, everything is cool. I said, OK. <laughs> but my point is, that you have to learn through all those things. And you, many of us take it for granted that that is like part of our life because we grew up with that. But for, for a lot of people coming from different countries, it is really hard. Um, and so that was a good learning. The cold was brutal. And so I decided, OK, I can stand max two winters. Um, and uh, then we decided to move to Silicon Valley. Um, it was other, other funny things there is that, um, um, okay, let me talk about Silicon Valley. So I moved in Silicon Valley at the peak of the technology um, boom. And uh, there were two companies I worked for. Obviously, Cisco was my first company. It was one of the hottest networking company out there. And um, did you guys? Yeah. You say at the peak of the boom, what year was that? Because there's a certain boom and bust cycle. <laughs> That's a good question. So this was in 99. So 99, 2000, it was really booming because of the whole Y2K. Everyone was fixing their backend systems to fix the Y2K bug. Sun Microsystems had this Unix timestamp, which they had to fix. And everyone was using Sun Microsystems servers. Um, it was, um, and companies were hiring left and right. You know, the managers, directors, VPs, they didn't even know what they are trying to fix, but they'll just hire people. Like, let's just get people, because we need to save ourselves. You know, signals will stop on January 1st, 2000. And it was weird. Like, everyone was hiring like crazy. And um, yeah, that was, that was the peak. The stock prices went up like 200, 300%. Cisco stock went to close to, like Cisco stock from 94, it doubled every year. And, and literally, the size of the company keep on gro uh, gro growing every year, uh, doubled every year, until 2000, when the stock went from $85 after splits 
to eight dollars. Sun Microsystem was at 140, it went to like three dollars. And, and this happened in a span of one year, right? Uh, March 2000 was the peak, and then everything fell off the cliff. So again, we were, all the software engineers were like, wow, this is the best lifestyle, we are making so much money, companies, we can do job hopping, you know, there was a weird uh, joke we used to make, like, you go to the terrace of the building and throw your resume, it won't fall down, somebody will take it before that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and by end of 2000, there was gloom everywhere. People were getting laid off. The layoff had just started, but over the next couple of years until 2003, 2004, massive layoffs, right? Silicon Valley real estate prices had crashed, and apparently we bought it in 2000 at the peak uh, with 95% um, loan and only 5% down. <laughs> um, so, but I was at Cisco, I thought I will not get laid off and I got laid off as well in 2004. And that was a really hard time because there was no hope that we'll get a job because like me, there were other 40 other people or 100 other people applying for one position. And, um, and again, like the twist and turn, right? What you call in life and it was really hard. It was really hard for me, for my family. And um, fortunately, in one of the social events, I met one of my friends who worked at Google. And Google, at that time, was hiring like crazy. That was probably the only company I remember who was hiring like crazy. Facebook was started in 2004 through the recession. And uh, so I told my friend, like, hey, I'm interested. How do I get there? And he said, oh, you have to prepare a lot. Uh, it's almost like going back to basics and preparing, opening up your data structures and algorithms work and start working on it. So, okay, um, I'll do it because I don't have any other option. So I started working on it. it took me three, four months. Um, fortunately, I had some network of friends who would, I would do some mock-up interviews with them because I knew that it's going to be a difficult one to pass through. Um, and fortunately, I got through it. So, and, and Google experience was awesome. Uh, I worked there for about seven years. Um, I enjoyed, I started on AdWords team, uh, doing sales engineering. So building some dashboards and tools for our sales teams. And then just before I left in 2011, I worked on Android. Um, Crazy benefits, um, crazy food, and like all the best things you can imagine, right? But um, so when I joined, it was about 2,500 employees. When I left, it was about 45. And uh, the reason why I left was this quote, right? Uh, it resonates very well. That even though I was working there last couple of years, it just didn't feel that I'm enjoying. And not only enjoyment, but I didn't feel that I'm doing something meaningful. <coughs> and I was asking, like, is this the place I want to retire? <coughs> so I decided, no, I don't want to. And I took this leap of faith to start my own company. Now, I started Mighty Text with a, with a fr because of a frustration I, I noticed. <laughs> we were at Google, and typically we would sit in these meetings till 5, 6 p.m. at least. And I just had my daughter, she was about two years old, and my wife would text me, hey, can you pick up our daughter from, from daycare? And I, I would miss that text message because that phone would be in my pocket, and I would not get that text message on my computer, right? And I always wondered, like, you get everything on your computer. You get emails, you get chat messages on multiple different clients. Why not text messages? So Google had a product called Google Voice, but it worked only with a separate phone number, which was a Google Voice phone number, and it was available only in US and Canada. Because they had to work with the Department of Telecommunications for each and every country to get the set of phone numbers before they can distribute, which was such an unscalable thing. So we decided, okay, 
is there a way we can think about taking an incoming test message to your, to your phone, intercepting it in real time, and pushing it on the computer? So I'm a co-founder who is also from Google. We actually locked ourselves in a room for a week. And not literally, but um, and we, we basically tested out different ideas based on the technologies available, right? Because everything you can do is based on what is available and what is feasible. So we found that on Android, there is an SMS receiver, so you can intercept a text message. And you can push it to our server in real time. And then from the server, you can do a push notification to your web browser. And you can build Chrome extension, so your Chrome extension can have a notification. So that's receiving. But then how do you reply back? So we found that the Google had something called GCM. At that time, it was called C2DM. But GCM is Google Cloud Messaging. Now it's called Firebase, uh, after they acquired a company called Firebase. And you can do a real-time push notification to your device. So we built the prototype. And uh, we found, oh, you know, you can build something like this. So I decided, OK, I'm going to leave Google. And so both I and my co-founder left Google. And we thought that, you know, we are Googlers. We will easily get funding. You know, the VCs will be super excited. And we'll raise lots of money. But, you know, whatever you think is not what we'll get, right? Um, that doesn't turn out the way you want. So just like this driver who's kind of confused, we were co-founders who were confused. You know, we thought, OK, yeah, we'll get everything. And um, we were rookie co-founders. Um, when we went to VCs, we found that, oh, yeah, VCs will talk great things like, yeah, you guys have great idea, but now I want to see a product. And we said, OK, yeah, we have built the prototype, and the, that's not enough. I want to see the product before I can fund you guys. And so we said, OK, it was a chicken and egg situation. Who will build the product? You know? So we, I and my co-founder started building the product. So it took us six months to get the product ready on Android, because you can only do this on Android. You can't do it on iPhones, because you have, would have to jailbreak the phones. So we did that on Android. And then we went back to the VCs, and they said, oh, yeah, um, but where is the user base? How will you grow your user base? Did you push it to Google Play? And we said, OK, um, we haven't done it, because I thought you wanted the product, so we showed you the product. Um, so we decided, OK, let's do it. We have released it. Let's push it out. We push it out on, the, on, the, on Google Play, and as you would have um, experience, uh, many of you guys, when you push it out, you get like 10 users or 20 users and 50 users, and most of them are your family and friends. <laughs> um, so that's what we experienced. Uh, we didn't get much traction. And we figured out some of the nuances on the product, what we had to change. And once we did that, like we initially built the Chrome extension. We found like a lot of Android users don't use Chrome. They use Firefox or Internet Explorer. So we decided, OK, instead of building a Chrome extension, there's just too many frictions in the product. And one thing we noticed is you have to remove the frictions to get user adoption. So we modified that for a few months. And we fortunately had this uh, VentureBeat article who were excited about our product because um, they felt like this is unique, nobody has done it, and so we should publish them. The day when they published us, we got 60,000 installs on that one day. So that was our biggest win. Um, and then we found out like, that after a few days, it dropped back you know, to 50 users. So what do we do? How do we get to like millions of users? right? So our product was free, and we, I and my co-founder, like, we met with a lot of people in Silicon Valley. How do you guys do growth viral marketing? You know, we need to get our users' uh, numbers higher. And they said, OK, you have a free, free product. Everyone who comes to you, install it. They, once they install it, put the first 
dialog box saying, okay, you need to publish it to your social media account that, hey, you are using Mighty Text. So then they would take that link and push it to Facebook and Twitter, and then just send us an email that, hey, I have published a social media account, and then we'll enable them to use the product. And that was a big hit. Because as soon as they published to their Twitter account and Facebook account, all their network connections of 500 people on Facebook, whatever, the number of friends, and on Twitter, they saw it, and they, everyone was like, oh, maybe I should look at this as well. So then we started seeing this massive viral marketing uh, taking into effect, which then people started downloading our app. Um, we started seeing install number increase. We were at about eight to 10,000 installs a day. Um, and it was pretty good because we thought like, okay, now we are optimizing for growth. We pushed really hard. Uh, we started doing advertising on AdWords and, and Facebook. And things were going great until we hit a plateau. And um, that plateau was mainly for multiple reasons. Uh, one was that we were based on SMS. And the problem is that WeChat and WhatsApp and Messenger, are all, all of them were eating over their lunch. And then iMessage, which came out in 2011 or 2012. So our, our churn rate was about 5 to 10%, but our growth rate was not enough. So we were having this ma massive plateau. And at that point in time, like, we tried to optimize for revenue. So we moved from about 20 million users were monthly actives. We started now. Uh, pushing them to, how do we make money out of this? Um, and so we tried multiple things. One was around uh, identifying who are your users, right? These are small and medium businesses. So for example, a real estate agent at 11 o'clock in the night, if they find a property, they will be able to send it through Mighty Text to all their users. But it's not a great experience to send it at 11 o'clock in the night. So what about scheduling the messages and allowing them to send it to 100 people at the same time? You can't do it on your phone. It's almost impossible to create a list of 100 people and then sending it out. And so that was pretty unique. Uh, and people started loving it. Um, we started seeing. And this was all coming based on our continuous interaction with our users. So they would send it on. Google Play or send us an email that, hey, I'm, I need this. How can I do this? You know? And so we started putting scheduling of the messages, templatization, um, a bunch of other features. And we started $5 a month charging to our uh, small and medium businesses. There was a trucking company who had a very interesting use case. He would be sitting in, tr in front of his panel, and all the truckers all around the country would be driving. And the continuous interaction would be through SMS. All these truckers would send a SMS to the control panel. And then he would see it, and then he would reply back from Mighty Text. And he would send like close to 2,000 messages a day through our system. And, and so we thought about tiering of our uh, users. We never actually implemented that. But um, then we thought that, OK, yeah, these users easily can benefit at $6 a, day, uh, a month. And so we, that's the way we introduced the pricing. Um, the product was successful, so it is still running. Um, we are generating um, revenue for about 70,000 our paid users. But the challenges of a startup which is not growing are significant. You kind of are then putting it in maintenance mode. Because every time you make a change, it affects your paid users. Right? At one point in time, we thought, OK, yeah, we should build something like WhatsApp. But what's the point, really? So we decided, OK, let's just continue running it. Um, I was not really enjoying it anymore. And I said, OK, I think for me, this is it. <laughs> um, and I wanted to do something more fun. So the reason why I'm telling you all this story right, is in our lives, what we expect is a straight line of success. But that never happens. It always is a twist and turn. Right? Expectation and reality are two different things. But what I found was that when the times are bad, 
you have to continue being persistent. And your goal should be there. You should continue to think about your goal. And personally, that is what I, I always um, was benefited from. I had very clear direction in terms of my goals. But um, the direction was there, but it took me a lot of twists and turns to reach there. I always tell, like, you need to have passion, interest, uh, learning, and growth. And uh, uh, your mindset should be around those four things. So, uh, like I said, I was not having that much enjoyment. Um, and I felt like, OK, I need to do something different. I knew a lot of people in Silicon Valley by then. Um, and I decided, OK, I, I started networking with people, met with a few VCs. And they said, oh, you know, you should start another company. And I was not ready to go for another four years. Um, it, is, it takes a toll. Uh, how many people are working in a small startup, less than 10 people? Three, four. Yeah, how's your, how's life? <laughs> Yeah. Do you enjoy it? Yeah. What about others? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been? Who's the longest time in the startup out of all the people who raised hands? Three years. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And how big is your company? Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I think one of the great things about startup is, you know, it's so flexible. And like you said, you know, you learn every single day. And that learning is super, super important. What, we, what I did in four years in, at Mighty Techs, I, could have ne I didn't learn that much at Google, even though Google was one of the best companies to work for. Um, when I left Google, I realized that I'll miss all the crazy benefits like food and free haircut. And, and drinks and all of that. But I realized that my first build I do, did at Mighty Text, I was trying to push it to our server. And I had to go through like 10 different scripts. And I had to write all by myself. At Google, with one command, everything was deployed on the server, on the cloud. And now it was available to like 10 million. Like you can create a cohort of users, and it will go to all those 10 million users. And so, yeah. Yeah. So the question is, when I was at Mighty Text, was I jack of all trades? Um, yes, because I, we did not get the funding. Remember initially, so we were my and co I and my co-founder were building pretty much everything. So there were three co major components in the product. One was the back end, which we hosted on Google App Engine and then Google Compute Engine. And the reason why we used, chose Google, even though AWS was really a better cloud platform at that time, is because we were getting those free um, like tokens from Google. <laughs> um, and, the, and then the second component was Android app. So I had to learn from scratch. I had never built an Android app before. But fortunately, Android had really good documentation. So I went through step by step building the Android app. They had great samples. And the third piece was the web client. So initially, we built a Chrome extension. Uh, so my co-founder built a web client because he knew how to write JavaScript and so on. So, and I was uh, building both the back end and front. So yeah, we were pretty much doing everything. And uh, once we got the funding, then we started building the team uh, to take care of different components. But even though we got the funding, not the amount we really aspired to get, uh, we were very miserly in how we spent the money, which was actually a mistake. As a co-founder, if you have a really long vision and a big vision, then you should spend money and hire, spend money in the right areas. right? not throw parties and all of that, or do weird things, so, uh, which in Silicon Valley happens. You know, a lot of startup funds, they get $100 million in funding, and then after 14 months, they are again looking for another $100 million. So um, yeah, I was not having fun anymore. 
I decided to network with people. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is whether I and my co-founder were looking at additional co-founders um, when we were looking for funding, right? So this is a very interesting question because this boils down to how should you select your co-founders and what is each person's role? We were not looking for other co-founders. Um, I knew my co-founder at Google for six years, so we kind of knew each other very well. And we used to always joke around, like, we will be looking, uh, seeing each other every single day, probably more than our spouses and other your girlfriends or whoever. So you better interact really well. So I and my co-founder knew each other very well. We used to hang out quite a bit, even though we had def very different styles. He grew up in the US. I never grew up in the US. Um, um, he had different interests. My interest was slightly different. But we worked really well. We knew each other uh, in terms of the work culture. And we, both the, the skills we both of us got on the table were very complementary. He had strong product vision and the product skills. And he had some client building skills because he was a product manager. And then I brought in the engineering skills. So it worked out really well. Now, additional co-founders, we could have got it, but what would they do? That's the question, right? If we had an enterprise product, then we would, we would need somebody on the sales side of the business. But if you don't have an enterprise product, if you have a consumer product, you don't need uh, salespeople or marketing people. When I see a consumer app company having marketing people as their executive team, I kind of baffle. Like, I don't know why would they have that, right? Um, cool. So, so one of my friends worked at Facebook, and he said, OK, you know, uh, do you want to come over, check it out? <clears throat> and I decided, yes, I want to do it. Fortunately, the interview was not that hard, because I kind of worked at Google and the startup experience. And one of the biggest advantages, and like you said, learning every day, it was a pretty easy for, easy for me to pass through the interview. So even though your startup may fail, there is a huge benefit of that learning and experience you get. So continue to take that risk and, and do learning. You should optimize in your early career for learning and not for money, even though the expenses are important thing. You, you want to pay your bills. But learning is where you should optimize. Um, this was uh, 2015. Facebook was growing extremely, extremely fast. The four major areas. And why I got fascinated by Facebook, I could have gone back to Google. But I thought Facebook was much younger, much fast moving. And some of the people I met were really, really entrepreneurial. And I felt like this is the place I want to be. There were four major engines of growth at that time. Facebook app, and they are still. Messenger, they had just finished the WhatsApp acquisition, and Instagram. And talking about consumer app, right? Instagram was only 13 people when they acquired them for one and a half million dollars. That's amazing. WhatsApp was about 60 people, 25 to 30 engineers for 19 billion dollars. There's no other industry I know of where you can have such less number of people making this huge impact. So that's about me. Um, hopefully, you got some insight into how I navigated through Silicon Valley. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges as a technology leader um, and how do we address challenges. And this will be some kind of amalgamation between what I learned at Mighty Text and at Facebook. And, and, and I've basically tried to find the best pattern and, and, and put it in the slides. And finally, I will leave you with a couple of thoughts. So this is the goal uh, at Facebook, but this really resonates with me. 
It's about creating an environment where people are empowered to create impact. Now, all the managers who uh, raise their hands, um, you, have, you know how important it is to hire great people. Software engineering, especially, is all about talent. We all, we all talk about like 10x engineer, like rock star engineers. And you know that, that 10x engineer, one person can make a huge, massive difference versus like hiring 10 mediocre people. And that's why you see from Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all these core software engineering companies, they have such a hiring, high hiring bar. The reason being, they may reject some good candidates because of the bar, which is high, but they don't want to hire any mediocre person in the company. Because what happens is once you have a mediocre person, at some point in time, that person will then hire other people or be part of the interview loops, and then the whole culture um, changes towards negative side. So people are the most important talent. Now, once you hire great people, you want to empower them to make decisions. There's no point in having, hiring great people and then the manager or director or VP makes all the decisions for them. Because that's almost like creating, um, killing the creativity of that person. So empowering that people is super, super important. And then, once you let them make those decisions, those decisions should be impactful and measurable. There's no point in anybody making random decisions which is not creating impact. Most of the top technology companies are very impact driven. And that also doesn't necessarily mean that they don't take risk in coming up with new innovation. But the goal should be to create impact. And so I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of the software company, typically. right? The biggest challenge, so if the company is not growing, there's no challenge. You, know, you don't do, have to do anything. Uh, you try to keep on grow, making it to grow. But if it's not growing, what do you do? You basically wrap it up and go home. Um, if the company is growing, there are certain challenges as well. And those are significant challenges. So here's the kind of a graph which basically shows um, how Facebook grew very quickly. Even at Mighty Text, we grew very fast. Now, we started hiring a lot of people, but then we immediately saw that hey, our growth was kind of getting stagnated, so we, we scaled back. But when you are growing extremely fast, you're hiring a lot of people. And um, with hiring a lot of people comes challenges of building the right culture, making sure all the engineers are working well together. You are investing in the right areas of the project. Because this growth will not continue forever, right? And the people you hire, they will be with you for a long time. And you want to make sure that you're building the right culture in the teams. And I'll go into more uh, details around this. But basically, growth creates issues around hiring, onboarding, integrating, uh, and so forth. Um, here are some of the, this is more specific to Facebook. But this is, uh, this is a great slide, because this is true for a lot of other companies as well. The first one, specifically for Facebook, was this acquisitions, right? We acquire a lot of companies. And you might have heard only for a few of them. Two of the most biggest acquisitions in the technology industry are Instagram and WhatsApp. But there are a lot of other small acquisitions we do. And when we acquire these companies, there are a lot of changes which happen. Right? You basically get WhatsApp and Instagram um, teams on board. And they, you want to make sure that they work as a separate identity. They have their own identity. They have their own culture. But you also want to make sure that they work very well with other products and teams. Um, then you have multiple different products. Right? You're investing in, even as a startup, Let's say you mentioned about pivoting across multiple products. As you change your direction, there's a lot of things you have to rethink. And a lot of effort is made um, in, in 
like, do we have the right skill set within our team to support this new product direction and so forth. So within products also at Facebook, we do a lot of investments in AR, VR, and we have been doing it for many, many years. Um, we have seen some success, but we want it to be more successful. We have uh, new investments made in, and you guys may have heard about Libra and Calibra, and we're facing a lot of heat actually right now. <laughs> um, but, um, but still, we are taking those risks. Well, I and have a yeah. I actually um, joined um, Yeah, so I don't know what I can talk about this because we are going through a lot of sensitivity around this. But um, I know for sure that we are pretty determined. And we were expecting quite a, quite a lot of uh, backlash around that. So we knew this is a risky thing, especially considering the stage at which we were to announce something like this. But the vision and the goal is to change the world, right? And, and we are trying to do whatever we can in terms of you know, making sure that we have this separate association and, and so forth. So I don't think I can go anything beyond that because I'm not the right person to talk about it. But we are pretty determined to continue. Say that again, what was the question? Was that a comment or a question? Yeah, it's a comment. It's just it's, it's fascinating me, and my whole family have been following it. Yeah. Because I also had some Bitcoin, and it, it kind of dropped around the time that we were targeted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I think, based on my limited understanding, we are not going to compete against Bitcoin. That was not the goal. Uh, but that's all I can talk about. But I know we want, I think there are a lot of advantages. and. Uh, and if you read, if you're following Calibra and Libra, there are a lot of advantages of coming with something like that. And we are taking that initiative as the first step, and we hope that there'll be other companies who will be part of that initiative. And there are external circumstances and factors uh, which force changes within our team, right? Um, clearly, we went through privacy and FTC and all of those issues, and we're still going through that. But the meta point here is that all those are affecting your business and how you make those decisions and how you invest your resources. So how do you evolve out of this and adjust to, the, to accommodate all these changes? That's the question. And uh, I'm going to come up with some of the solutions. So, and the last piece, and, and you guys definitely are, are facing this in your companies as well, is many of these challenges are dynamic, right? Product, you add a feature, you push it out, you test it, it works, it doesn't work, then you change it, it creates all this uh, massive technical debt on your, product, uh, on your product, and if you don't have a person who can document and clean up the code, then it continues more. As you may have seen, like when you pivoted to something else, all that other code is now sitting there unless somebody has time to clean it, and usually startup engineers don't have time, right? <laughs> um, at Facebook, also, we iterate our product in a crazy manner. Like, we have literally hundreds and thousands of experiments at a product level, per product, running at a given time. And we have different cohorts of users in those experiments. So right now, if you guys are all Instagram users, even though you have the same app, you may be in different cohorts, and you might be seeing slightly different features within your apps. Um, code compilation and sanity of the code is super, super important, because that's we live and breathe code. And for us, everything is making sure that we are able to build the code, push it to our servers, test it, automate as much as possible, and make that whole process super simple. But as the team grows, as your product becomes bigger, 
and have different components like client, multiple different clients, uh, server components, and servers use different caching and CDN and distributed uh, architectures and so forth, it becomes more and more complex, right? Um, how fast do you do the builds? I know at Facebook, when I started five years back, we used to do builds once every week. And that was really fast. Like a lot of people don't do builds every week because we are pushing it out to hundreds of millions of people. Then we decided, OK, this is the cadence. We need to increase the cadence to twice a week. Then we increase it to daily. Today, we do it real time. An engineer can push the code in real time. It will be running. It will test it. And it will push to the server in real time. So building your infrastructure with the growth and making sure that you are keeping up the pace is super important. And finally, as for many of the startups, you have one team. But when the company grows beyond certain level, you have multiple teams. right? At, WhatsApp, at Facebook, we have WhatsApp, Instagram, IGTV, Facebook. Within Facebook app, there are probably like 20 teams. Um, what did I miss? Messenger and various other teams. So how do you make sure that all these teams are working well together, their cultures, identities are kept separately, but still they work well together, right? So these are all the great big engineering challenges. And if you don't, as a technology leader, if you don't think about it, your company won't survive. At some point in time, systems will fail. So you have to make sure that you are able to build that culture within the team. So I'm going to talk about some of the solutions which Facebook has employed. And as a startup, also, you can actually have this. And it's important to build the culture from the seed. You want to start seeding it. And many of you here, I hope all of you become aspire, whoever aspires to be leaders, you actually become leaders um, and, and grow your teams uh, in a big way. Facebook's core premise of engineering culture is taking risk. And when I say taking risk means think about creativity. Think about if you feel that something is not possible, question why. And try it out. You know, The core premise is for every engineer is that you have to take risk. If you're not taking enough risk, then there's a problem. And that will get reflected in the performance cycle and all of that. If you're just cruising the, uh, the waters, then it's not good. You're not going to succeed. From that, one of the most important things we talk about is openness and transparency. And I'll give you a couple of examples why this is super important. So you might have seen groups, right? You, many of you guys have used Facebook groups where you communicate. Like we have developer circles groups where people communicate and so forth. We have an internal version of that groups, what we call it as workplace. And within, and you can, if you are interested in workplace, you can actually search for workplace. You can find it, but then you have to connect with our our teams to get access to the full workplace because it's for a organization and a, and a group. Um, the biggest advantage of these kind of groups are within your company, you can create different groups. And each of these groups can be secret, closed, or open. And most of these groups are open. The biggest problem in software development is redundancy of projects. There will be one team which may be working on something, and then all of a sudden there's other team which is kind of reinventing the same wheel which somebody else has already done. And I've seen in my previous companies as well, this is such a common issue that literally millions and billions of dollars are wasted in engineers running do, through this project, hiring teams, and then after six months they find, oh, this other team there is also doing the same thing. Facebook solves this problem through groups. Let's say there is a group called AI, okay? And there are multiple groups within AI or named as AI, and there's AI for PyTorch, and, and so forth. If I want to start a new project on AI, the first thing I should do is 
either create a group or search other groups, which has done AI, and kind of validate my ideas with that group. Because within that group, I find all the history of all the posts made by engineers in that group. And I can get all the content out from those groups. And I can look through, people may have posted, comments, there's files, and like tons of information, right? And if I have a question about my idea, or then I can post it in that group. And then hopefully, all the people who are knowledgeable about AI will respond to that and give me a full picture of what I'm thinking and where I'm going wrong and what I should pivot to and so forth. This removes the redundancy significantly. Just imagine if I didn't have this, I would talk to a few people because I go and ask my manager, hey, who's the person on AI I should talk to? He'll direct me to a couple of people based on his understanding. And then I'll go and talk to that person and he'll tell me something which will be limited based on his scope of knowledge, and then I'll start building something. Which then after six months, I'll realize, oh, there's this whole other team which was building something, which has already built what I built. And I, what I have done is wasted my time, hired all these engineers, and lost great amounts of productivity. So that openness is tremendously beneficial in increasing the productivity. The second is transparency. So transparency is, the, when I hear about transparency, it, the first thing which comes in mind is senior management, how transparent they are with the lowest level on that whole tree, right, the leaf. And I'll give you an example of Mark Zuckerberg. Every Friday, or every Thursday now, he has this open Q&A with the entire company. Anybody can go up to the mic and ask him questions. About a few months back, we had this, um, we were going, there was a town hall meeting related to privacy and security and FTC announcement. And there were a lot of interns at that time in the office. And interns are basically, they are working, uh, they're studying, and then for three months, they just come to do a project, and then they go back to studying, right? They have full access to go to up to the mic and ask questions. In that one meeting, there were about 10 to 12 people who asked questions. Six of them were interns. I've never seen any other company anywhere in the world where an intern can go up to the mic and ask a company's CEO a company as large as 40,000 employees, questions about FTC or anything related to that, privacy. So I'm basically getting the direction to move fast so that you guys can have some drinks. But that's the, that's the power of transparency. I thought I didn't have enough time to talk about, like I, I, I wouldn't be able to talk for 60 minutes, but I'm actually going over. <laughs> uh, autonomy and freedom. Um, Again, this is super important. And how many people have heard about boot camp? OK, so this is an immensely useful program at Facebook, which is a six-week um, program where anybody who joins the company, for first six weeks, they go through this program, which is almost like a Facebook university, where you learn through the entire tech stack, learn through the products, learn through various different orientations and so forth. And literally the second day of boot camp, you will have access to the entire code base for all apps. And there will be assigned mentor for that person, and that person will have been given a task, and you will be actually expected to fix it, write some code to fix a bug, and push it in real time to production so that you can see the impact of your work. Again, like pretty amazing that entire code base is available to you on, literally on second day of work. And this is a six weeks training program. So third or fourth week, company uh, managers, engineering managers from different teams will come and ask you to join their teams. Uh, and you can decide that which team to join. 
you can decide that, hey, I don't, I'm not interested in um, some client-side work on WhatsApp, but I'm interested in the back-end work. And if the engineering manager and you guys are aligned, then you can join that team. So again, very powerful. You have the full autonomy and freedom to decide. Again, the reason why I'm saying this is this is what you want to seed into your companies as well, because this is really powerful. Um, assuming best uh, intent, as the company grows, there'll be islands of teams. You want to make sure they work well together, and you want to put yourself in other people's shoes. Um, I have several examples, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move fast on this. How much time do I have, by the way? OK, five minutes. And acceptance and celebration of failure. So this is super important. When we ask people that, hey, you should take risk, we are also telling them that it's OK from our side to take risk. Right? If you screw up, we won't fire you. We have a joke around which say, like, it's OK to screw up first time. It's not OK to screw up twice. So uh, we accept uh, failures, and we celebrate it as well. Um, I'll talk about the partner and developer ecosystem, because this is the team I lead. So anything goes from product to platform and are used by businesses to engage their users is what our team works with. So Facebook for developers, where you have APIs, which are used by other uh, partners um, to engage with their user base is what um, our teams use. So for example, Facebook login. 30% of all apps and internet uses Facebook login. We benefited tremendously by that. We think that partners can benefit. It removes the friction for people to log in. They don't have to remember username and password. And I know several companies are using it, even public companies. Their businesses are dependent on this. Messenger platform is another one where companies are building Messenger bot to interact with their users, both on the customer care, social commerce. These are very powerful use cases. And I wanted to talk about partner engineering because uh, based on my talk in Berlin, um, Sebastian told me, like, hey, you should talk about this. So partner engineering is engineering plus partner customer facing role, where you have software engineers who are in working with our partners and technical counterparts at the partner site to, um, to provide them solutions and integration. So this includes deep integrations. Um, these partner engineers are typically voice of the product team externally, and they are also the voice of the external partners to the internal product teams. And they work across pre-sales, so when the deal is not closed, they would work with the RFP, help them understand our offering, They'll build sample apps, documentation, and so forth. They'll also work with privacy, legal, and security teams to make sure that the contracts, which has technical language, is something which we can offer to the partners. And what do we need to have strong partner engineering skills, right? Um, Partner-facing skills. So strong technical skills. Most of the partner engineers on my team come from software engineering background. But then you also need strong business acumen. Being able to learn about partners' business models and why they are doing certain things in a certain manner. And then map that business requirements to your technical requirements. I think this is super important, emotional intelligence. Everyone should have this. Uh, but uh, partners, uh, partner-facing role, this, is, this becomes super important because when a company like Facebook or Google, they are 800-pound gorilla, and when they change anything in their product, the businesses get affected immensely. And it is super important for partner engineers to support these customers and vendors and, and partners. And thinking win-win solution, again, related to emotional intelligence, but always, whenever you are coming out with a solution, make sure that you're thinking win-win. So this is my last slide. Um, as aspiring leaders and people who are already managers, you should think about this thing, right? The first question, which is, does your company have a healthy culture? And again, I'm not saying that Facebook is the only company which has healthy culture. There are a lot of very successful technology companies like Microsoft, Google, 
and so forth. And um, they all are very different. They ha all have their own culture. But as an engineering leader, when I grew up um, from software engineering to the director of engineering right now, and as a CTO, this was the number one thing I focused on. Because the people we hire, the people we bring in, we want to make sure they align with the values we want to create. And second is the partner engineering. If you guys have requirements of interfacing with the partners, and if you are asking your software engineers to do it, you might want to rethink. You might want to hire somebody who's interested in doing it, because software engineers may want to just code. You know, They want to just build products. So you might want to rethink about introducing this new function, partner engineering. Thank you so much. Uh, we kind of did the five-minute warning purely because we knew there'd be a ton of questions. In fact, I think I already saw a few hands shoot up. So. I just have to call my kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned about hiring the best talent, but in a context of the a startup, like, how much do you think that is true, given that you possibly are just looking for product fit and you have a limited investment? Like, how much like, do you think like, companies that are just starting should look for best talent? Um, and then, like, for example, at what point do you really think that you should focus on kind of taking engineering risks on that context? Because I guess like you have like limited investment, you're looking yeah. for product fit. Like when do you think is the right moment to start focusing on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, as a startup, um, how do you hire the best talent with limited resources? And uh, when do you take the risk if you're not able to hire the best talent, right? I, I, um, I would optimize for hiring the best talent. If you have limited funding, and let's say if you want to hire five engineers, I would hire three engineers. But I would limit it to hiring the best engineers. Um, there will be areas where, depending on your product cycle, if, if co-founders can fill in those roles to help move the product, then you can make those educated decisions that, OK, I don't want to hire the best product manager because he's highly priced and there's nothing available. Most are getting hired from other big companies, which are paying them like twice. Um, if one of the co-founders can actually step into that role and, and mentor a junior engineer, then that's also good. Hiring best engineers doesn't necessarily mean experienced engineers. You can hire inexperienced engineers, but who, are, who have very strong mental ab ability to move forward, right? High aptitude depending on how you interview people. Um, talented people can be everywhere and can vary in different experience levels. One at the very, very back. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Let's see your right. throw. Everyone is ready. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was curious whether you have uh, product managers or technical product managers when you have uh, partner engineers, is, is, do, do they replace product managers? Because you say they interface requirements of your customers. Yeah, so technical product manager, so the question is how technical product managers and partner engineers are different, or? You also have product managers, or you just have partner engineers? Yeah, we do have product managers. So the question is, do you have product managers and partner engineers? Uh, at Facebook, we have three major functions, or actually four, one is, core engineers, software engineers. We have product managers. We have partner engineering kind of role. So it, they are called partner engineers or solutions engineers. And then we have uh, technology program managers. And then there's a sales component as well. So those are four or five roles. Uh, there could be more, but those are main roles. Technical product managers are slightly different because they define the product vision for it could be a consumer app not necessarily having partners, but partner engineers are more focused on platform and working with the partners and customers. But they, are, they have a lot of similarities in the skills, how they interface with the partners and so forth. Yeah. So uh, going back to your startup, yeah. so let's say you're a software engineer, you have like five years of experience, and you've got an idea to start something. You've already got an MVP but you don't really have experience in scaling. You don't know what you need money for. You don't need, 
you don't know how you're going to invest these money. So how do you get to first convince VCs and how do you actually get to utilize large amounts of funds to do something other than coding, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, if you're an engineer with five years experience, you have an MVP ready, but you don't know how to scale and, uh, and convince the VCs to get the funding, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, it's super important as a co-founder to have a vision. And that vision is super, super important. That's what is VCs are looking for. When VCs are investing in you, they are businesses. There's a joke which we call it as not venture capitalist, but vulture, cap vulture, vulture something. Uh, because they are businesses. They are looking for 10x return. And if you don't have the vision, but if you have a small product and MVP, and they cannot see that vision, then it will be really hard for you to get funding. So it's super important. And as a co-founder, also, you need to have vision. Because you will soon pass that stage that, hey, you have some users. But then how do you navigate your product? And how do you inspire other people to come and join the, your company? Right? So there was a question about how do you get great people on the company? People get motivated by compensation, but other is the vision right, of the growth. So as a CEO or a CTO or any co-founder, if you don't have the vision, then you need to build that vision first before you go to the founders, because that's the, that is going to be the pillar for you to influence and get people to join your company and also get funding. And also articulate your message to the outside world. So essentially saying, if you're the kind of person who would do this, then you already know what to do, essentially. Sorry? So you said, essentially, if you're the kind of person who would start a company, you already know, essentially, what to do if yes. you've got this vision. You, yeah. yeah. Just building a product is not the only thing, though. You need to have vision, as, as a co-founder. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, regarding sort of workplace, you mentioned sort of vision. <laughs> Facebook's obviously quite a B2C sort of company. How do you communicate the sort of vision for workplace to uh, <laughs> other companies to sort of... Sorry, I cannot... Uh, how I do you communicate the vision for workplace uh, to companies that want to sort of buy that product in quite a crowded market, I guess, of other sort of... How do you communicate the vision of the workplace? Work uh, the, the workplace product. So workplace product. Yeah, yeah. If I'm the owner of the workplace product, and how do I communicate the vision? Um, well, partners work on it, right? So it's part of the partner engineering role. I don't understand the <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, OK, let's, yeah, let's assume you own the, the workplace product. Yeah. Sure. How do I communicate the vision? Sure. Um, I kind of explained that uh, um, where workplace allows you multiple things. One is it opens up the platform where multiple different teams can look at what work has already been done. So the whole idea of groups allows you to keep the, all the historical context and other teams when they are starting new projects they can actually look at uh, what is already going on. So to give you a more concrete example, I'm part of like literally 20 or 30 core groups and probably other 50 non-core groups, which I'm not even looking at it every day. And those could be, you know, Messenger FYI, employee FYI, and uh, Messenger business integrations, and GraphQL, and all these are groups. So if there is a question, or if I have new ideas on Messenger, I'll post it in that group. And then all the people related to, whether it's product managers, engineers, they can actually reply back to that group. I'm also part of PyTorch AI group. Now, if I have new ideas around open sourcing Py PyTorch, I mean, PyTorch is open source, but if I have new ideas around use cases built on top of PyTorch, then I can post it in that group and people can comment. So that's the power of Workplace. I don't know any other products. I mean, there are products like Slack and, and, and several which are trying to do something similar, but at, at Facebook, we, we feel that that reduces the redundancy, which is the number one reason why we use Workplace. Sure, sure but why, how would a partner engineer work on 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So now I get the full yeah. context of yeah, your yeah, earlier question. Um, the pa partner engineer will work with the enterprise to explain the power of Workplace. And Workplace is also extensible. So we have APIs on top of it. So let's say if we are selling Workplace to Coca-Cola, and they want to use Workplace for their 100,000 employees, they may want to modify certain things. They may not want the exact plain vanilla version. Mm -hmm. And partner engineers will build those custom integrations for them. Sure. Uh, we questions. One more thing that's worth noting, um, other than really thanking Amit for his time this evening, is that we've just found out that it's your birthday today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, it was actually yesterday. But <laughs> it was actually yesterday. Yeah. Oh, it was actually yesterday. But we're still going to sing you happy birthday anyway oh, because no. <laughs> we have a room full of people. We're live streaming, so why not? You know, like really maximize this. Thank you. So, guys, <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. This is so embarrassing. Happy birthday, dear <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, Amit, thank you very much for spending your time with us yes. today. We, I think you probably have another 15 minutes or so of networking time. And we're actually just about to leave this room, head next door, where there's a ton of pizza and more drinks. So you've got plenty of time to snack and network. Thank you so much. And as a final note, I would love you guys, if you can, to check your inboxes, either tonight or tomorrow morning, um, and take the time to just give us a little bit of feedback on the event. Um, any feedback you can give us really helps us to make these events even better in future. So next door for pizza.